I am mining investor and editor of Resource Stock Digest, Gerardo Del Real, here with my partner, Senor Nicolas Hodge, who's also an investor and the publisher of Daily Profit Cycle. This is the 257th episode of our weekly therapy session that we call Investing in Bizarro World. We're going to talk Bitcoin. We're going to talk gold. We're going to talk hedge fund whales. We're going to talk lithium. And we're going to talk a little bit on some of the crazy and not so crazy stuff that is going on constantly all around us. But before we get into that, Mr. Hodge, how are you? How was your Valentine's Day? How was your Super Bowl weekend? Was it as good as America's sweetheart Taylor Swift's Super Bowl weekend? Um, I think you said it. They weren't going to let her lose. So um, it was a good game, though. I went into overtime. Obviously, you know what happened. It, we had a good week. We had a Super Bowl party. Um, I mistakenly bought some plant-based <laughs> Supersata instead of meat-based, which um, was not a crowd pleaser. So we might talk about why um, real meat uh, still matters. But anyway, no, we had a good week. Valentine's Day was low-key. We went out to dinner the week before. Um and just played it close to the best at home. How about you? It was very, very, very similar weekend. It was uh, my younger sister's birthday, so we celebrated her 40th on Saturday. Friends came in from out of the, uh, out of state. Uh, that carried into a Sunday Super Bowl party. Had a great time. It was a phenomenal game through and through. It was a fun game to watch. I enjoyed the performances. Uh, the commercials were iffy, right? I think the Dunkin' Donuts one for me was by far um, the, the the best one of the batch. And if you get an opportunity, y'all, take four minutes and watch the extended version of that commercial. It is really, really well done and really hilarious. So if you want to get a good laugh and you have a sense of humor, go check it out. That was good. It was, it, it was all right. Washing of the Feet was a commercial I remember. So that whatever religious group that does the Super Bowl commercials keeps getting traction because I think they had some before, but... Whatever. I didn't pay too close of attention, if I'm being honest. I didn't think they were all that great. It was a lot of mostly celebrities this year and, and no Bitcoin, I guess, is the call out. No crypto commercials. Very interesting. You know, the washing of the feet. This is complete, you know, rumor mill. Saw it on a, in an article. Don't know if it was like an onion headline or a new me or a real news media outlet because I can't tell the difference anymore nowadays. But uh I, I was reading somewhere that that group actually is funded by uh, this this very obviously religious group that is very, very anti LGBTQ and all of the letters. Right. And has been accused in the past, you know, of, 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 of kind of, you know, inciting a lot of hateful theories and posts and things of that nature. Again, I can't verify it. I, I wouldn't put the name of the group out there without doing so. But if anyone is curious enough. Uh, yeah, go check it out. It was interesting. Well, I'm sure he gets them, if that's true. <laughs> I'm sure. Let's get into it. It was an interesting week. We had hotter than anticipated CPI data, right? The, the inflation data. Imagine that, right? Guys, look, guys and gals, whatever you say about the podcast, you get your money's worth. It's a free podcast. We told you the Chiefs were going to win. They weren't going to let Taylor lose, right? And, and we told you that the data was not going to give Jerome the cover that he needed to keep cutting rates. And I don't know where the disconnect in critical thinking is. And I don't fancy myself a very, very astute critical thinker. However, there were seven major banking institutions that had priced in not one, not two, but up to seven rate cuts this year. Make that make sense to me, Nick. Or maybe it was seven different groups that priced in multiple rate cuts when the data just isn't there yet. And, you know, as a consequence, we had the the, the largest uh, single point and percentage drop in the major indices of the year. We have now bounced back from that as if everything is awesome again. That's worth talking about. Uh, I'll leave the floor to you, sir, because you watch the major indices and the volatility index a lot more closer than I do. It's yeah, it's time to be nimble is what I've been writing about. And it's um, not time to not pay attention. So uh, we talked about the logic flip and the, and the double speak last week where in December mm -hmm. the Fed was super dovish. We were going to get all these rate cuts. As you just said, uh, the market was pricing in like a 90 percent chance of, of rate cuts in March. And then um, they had the January Fed meeting and, and started to basically say the opposite. Um, and then Jerome Powell went on 60 Minutes and really said the opposite. 
Um, uh, some of the quotes from the meeting uh, in 60 Minutes were talking about wanting more confidence that um, inflation was coming down before they were um, going to cut rates. And then that led to sort of what you just described. Um, a little bit of it, market panic, um, sell off, uh, but then going back up. And that's what I was saying last week is that the data was changing. So um, I said that we got the, the inflation right. Um, that I had been saying for well, basically since this whole inflation thing started and, and rate cuts that you were going to get higher rates for longer because you were going to get higher inflation for longer. Um, so that part was right. But what's changed is, was the, the growth I was telling you. We got a, a, a robust GDP number for Q4 um, in the U.S. And then we got that, you, you know, good jobs number. Weeks seem to blur now. But, you know, going back a couple of weeks, you got a three hundred and fifty some thousand dollar non-farms payroll number against an estimate that, that had a 100 and some uh, 100,000 handle on it. So um, the U.S. economy was robust. And I was telling you last week that that jobs number meant that you would likely get positive GDP this quarter, which meant yep. that you wouldn't or couldn't both get a recession in the U.S. because you need negative GDP to get a recession, right? So I was telling you that um, stocks could go up um, even if inflation and rates stayed higher. And that's exactly what you just said. Markets went back to all-time highs after we got the the sticky high inflation number, and that's because you have the growth sort of backstop now. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is other markets continue to deteriorate. I woke up this morning to Japan in a recession. I woke up this morning to the UK in a recession. And so in some ways, you've got sort of that Tina trade back on, right? Like, what is the alternative if the U.S. is not going to have a recession, um, is is money coming into to U.S. markets and uh, U.S. equity markets. And so anyway, I sort of said all that last week, and, and that's what we saw um, since then uh, in the markets. So the S&P back at all-time highs, I told you I recommended, or maybe I didn't, but I did in the in foundational profits. We recommended like an S&P low volatility fund. I mean, that's, you know, put in a one uh, one and a half percent move in two days. Uh, those used to be big moves in, in macro markets. Oh, you're but now sure. You're, <laughs> But now you've got these tech stocks going up higher, which is a, a, a whole nother uh, discussion. But anyway, that's sort of it. Um, a growth in the U.S. OK and inflation stubbornly high, but sort of always knew that was going to be the case, um, which means rate cuts not coming likely until the second half uh, unless things start to break in a major way. And um, I was telling you that gold was sort of sideways on that. Uh, and so that's it continued to be the case. And so. I give it a bit of pause to gold in the in the short term, but um, ultimately going to 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 really lead to more explosive upside to gold. I think once the um, ultimate pivot does come, you know, later this year. So um, that's uh, painting with a really broad brush. What else do you want to talk about? No, I uh, let, let's keep it to gold because I think you raise a good point. Um, the initial reaction when uh, that CPI number came in and people kind of realized, well, it's not happening in the next meeting, right? For sure, unless something breaks, which nobody wants. The initial reaction was gold, you know, below the 1900 level. I think it touched the 1978, 1980 level briefly. It's now back above the 2000 level one day later. The dollar index, which again, the correlation there is, is, is pretty, pretty tidy right now. The dollar index, when we got that CPI report, surged 1.25% uh, above the 105 level and now is back closer to the 104 level. So the core, the, 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 there's different asset classes that are starting to correlate on a more consistent basis, which I find as, 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 as a good thing, right? Because for a bit, all markets seem to have a mind of the road, and that's really scared capital, staying on the sidelines, not wanting to commit. I like the fact that we at least have some order to the markets as it relates to some of the asset classes. And look, when I uh, look at Druckenmiller, right, Stanley Druckenmiller um, deciding that he's selling Alibaba and Amazon and a few of his other big tech plays where he's made great money on and he's picking up the Barry Golds and the Newmonts of the world. That's a whale. That's whale money. That's not Gerardo and Nick money or our group money, right? That is that is big, big capital coming into a sector where that kind of attention and those kind of endorsements um, tend to bring more capital and more endorsements. And so I'm excited to see what the last half of this year looks like for gold. I continue to insist 
that we will see new all-time highs in the gold price. I'm not convinced that happens in Q1 or Q2 yet. And look, there's a gentleman whose models I, I, I like to peek at from time to time, Martin Armstrong, who has a spectacular backstory. I mean, spectacular backstory. The guy did prison time for seven or eight years. The feds took his model. He was predicting, you know, big global financial crashes uh, to the day. And the government was not too happy about that. They wanted the model. He refused to turn it over. He was held in in, in New York prison, city prison, um, for I think it was something like eight years. It's like, It was like the longest amount of time that someone's been detained, incarcerated without bail and without a trial at the time anyhow, right? And so he gets back out. He has his model. He's picking stuff back up. I bring his story up, one, because it's fascinating. Two, because he's saying that we're going to get one last head fake down, one last shaking of the tree in the gold price before we see new all-time highs again here before the end of the year. So it kind of coincides with the tea leaves that I lo- like to look at and the tea leaves that I'm reading and you know the little critical thinking that I do. It makes all the sense that you get some cuts in the second half of this year, that the dollar loses some of its strength, and that capital starts to rotate a bit away from some of the names that have led this rally into record territory in the major indices because that trade is only going to provide so much juice before it runs dry. I like when the Drucken Millers of the world start to look to rotate capital outside of a sector and start looking at the sectors that I really enjoy dabbling in and, and I'm comfortable with. And, you know, I, I think um, the last point I'll make, I don't think it's a coincidence that Bitcoin's at the 52,000 level you know, after a mini pullback. And we talked about that last week, but I think Bitcoin is also emerging as the asset class that we've been telling you all it is. And so a lot of things are starting to line up with underlying markets. Some of it still isn't totally computing for me, like the major indices at record levels, despite the fact that mortgage rates are above 7%, that the jobs report was relatively weak here recently. Some of those things still don't line up for me, but I am starting to see order in a lot of other markets, and I think that bodes well for the market that I try to specialize in, and that's the one I dabble 100% of my time other than real estate in, and that's the the resource space, which has been weak, 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 weak across the board pretty much. Yeah, market flow has been interesting. You know, we've talked or uh, I've written about the advent of of, of short-dated options and the amount of money that sort of pushes around the the S and P, and we obviously know about the Magnificent Seven and and how much weight they have, and et cetera. So market dynamics have shifted, which is one of the reasons that we can be at all time highs while you know people are living in caves in in California, right? We we say that the market, the stock market, is not the economy, and um, you sort of always know that, but it's really on display recently with um, you know wealth disparity and again the amount of you know money that can bully around options. Um, and then again, some of the data uh, starting to change with uh, with the growth, so um, uh, allowing uh, U.S. equities to go back to records. But back to gold. So um, I don't know a lot about Martin Armstrong. Some people, including you, have told me about him from time to time, or, or forward me, forwarded me some of his sure. articles or uh, prognostications, etc. Um, I could see gold going down. Uh, in the, in the very short term before it goes back up. But I, I, I prefer to look at the chart and, and see what that says. So um, I think gold is, you know, medium to long term bullish and is a sort of short term, um, I don't know, a waffling or short term looking for direction. Um, you mentioned correlations. So I was there with you, man. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I think I put a chart in Hodge family office of the dollar and gold and uh, the U.S. 10-year, and they were all up for the year. Like, that's not supposed yeah. to happen, right? <laughs> um, unless something is breaking. And then those correlations so, sort of came back, which is what you said. You were talking about the dollar. I guess I'll mention the 10-year because um, if the U.S. economic data is improving, if the if the U.S. GDP is going to be, you know, stronger than once thought, if it's going to be growing at 3 or 4% and, and um, not 1%, then it makes sense for that U.S. 10-year to go up, which is what it's been doing. Um, and at the same time, a uh, gold has sort of gone sideways last week. I think I told you it was uh, down sort of 1% since Jerome said, you know, 
uh, higher for longer. It's it's come down a tiny bit more, as you said, flashed all the way down to 1970. Importantly, and that's the sort of the short-term sideways, short-term neutral part of it. Importantly, it caught itself right there. Yep. Um, yep, yep, yep. It went back to 2000, like you said. And so, you know, whereas gold loves to fool people, right? Whereas a couple of weeks ago, I was telling you there's a base at 2000. It's trying to make one at 2020. Well, you know, a, a week or two later, that 2020 is out of the question. And now it's, you know, back to the base at 2000, right? But um, anyway, uh, what I was saying is that it caught itself at that mid 1970s level. And, and that's sort of the, the low end now. I'd call it maybe a bit higher, 1980 some. Um, uh, but it doesn't want to go below that. And so that's the, the medium to, to long term bullish part of it. Um, you mentioned uh, a couple of high net worth people. Um, they're not the only ones, but I'd be interested to know when Pelosi gets into the gold trade. That, that'd be interesting to know. But um, that would know, be the all clear. Some other people are in there too, like yeah. like John Paulson, well, who we, we've written about a lot over yeah. the years, and um, is in, invested in a project that you and I have been to visit, and, and we'll be talking more about here in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I do <laughs> think it's time to. I mean, just watch what we do, right? This is a free podcast, so you don't get to see what we do in the letters. But um, like last week, I sold a gold stock and this week I, I bought a gold stock, right? And so, you know, it depends about, you know, is, what is it? What kind of gold stock is it? What's your sizing? What's your duration? Like, how long do you intend to hold this thing for, right? And so... I get that um, often. What's your sizing? What's your duration? <laughs> <laughs> how long do you need to hold it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't because, help myself. You know, sometimes, sometimes, um, and this is where you get your value of the podcast, not just in, in, in the comedy, but it, it, in points like this, right? Like, you know, sometimes I'll, if I think gold is going to go up, um, I might buy like a liquid gold producer, right? Because if I think gold is going to go up in the short term, I can buy a liquid producer and know that it's going to get a, a, a short term bump. Not that I'm some trader, but right. I'm just using like a short term move inside of the, like my process or how I'm currently viewing the market. Right. And so if I'm saying that gold is weak in the short term has gone down marginally on these higher rates, um, I don't want to be in those, you know, some liquid producer that I, I don't want to hold for the long term. Right. But um, if this short term weakness in gold is going to give me the opportunity to buy some, you know, high quality, robust deposits that are trading at a significant discount to their NPV or to their project value or to, you know, whatever I think it is that I can scale into um, for a long term hold because I know gold is going in the higher in the longer term, then I'll take advantage of that, too. And so um, you got to be able to hold both those thoughts in your head, I guess. And and, and it's not always easy, but gold uh, long term bullish, I guess, is the conversation we're having. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think uh, I think you're spot on. And that brings me to, you know, still my single largest, I know, broken record, personal holding and largest cash part of, you know, my portfolio, Patriot Battery Metals, which I, I, I'm i not calling the all clear. I'm not saying it can't break down again. I'm saying we talk, I joked about triple bottoms last week and it really looks like it's not wanting to go much lower than that 675, 680 level Canadian. You know, the last three or four days, every time it, it it breaks that, it turns right back around. And it really looks like it wants to put a base in around the $7 level. And if that's the case, you know, when I start looking around, when I listen to Albemarle's conference call, and I see the fact that, you know, demand year over year, last year was up some 30%. Demand is still projected to continue to be double digits for the remainder of the decade, supply is being impacted around the world. And look, the cure to low prices is, is low prices, folks, as Rick Roll likes to say. A lot of these projects, and I, I said this a couple of weeks ago, a lot of these projects that are being um, tabled as future supply coming online simply aren't ever going to make it. So you talked about tier one deposits. You talk about infrastructure. We talk about, you know, a macro backdrop. Lithium right now is as attractive as it's been in quite some time, especially given how advanced a company like a Patriot is, where a lot of the, the, the de-risking has already happened. And now you're getting the government starting to help with the other part of the de-risking, which of course is the permitting. We had the energy minister of Canada come out and say that it absolutely will be accelerating critical mineral mining, specifically in lithium graphite, nickel, cobalt, copper, and rare earth elements. 
That is a huge endorsement for a project like Corvette, which is close to infrastructure, close to green power, right? You got a so hydroelectricity there that is going to make um, the, the, the economics of that project really, really attractive. You got a monster, you got monster deposits. I think there's going to be several, several deposits that are mined out of Corvette before it's all said and done. You got long mine life. You got simple mineralogy. You have companies like GM and Panasonic just announced that they're going to be investing directly in a Canadian miner to source its graphite for the next six to eight years once it's able to go ahead and then consummate that deal. So look, when I see the likes of a GM, a Panasonic, a Northvolt, a Volkswagen, a, a, a Ford, and then moving in right with the checkbook and Albemarle. And then I see the Canadian government tell me that it is hyper-focused on expediting the permitting times for these projects. All of that checks a lot of boxes for me. So long-term holdings, uh, Patriot Battery Metals is, is as good as that one gets um, in, in, in my mind. And if you're looking for another one, we talked about this one last week too. It's been taken to the woodshed the last you know month and a half or two. Bravo mining, you know, it's gotten cheaper since since last week. Not on a lot of volume. It was down four and a half percent today on eight thousand shares. So it was down four and a half percent, and it took ten thousand dollars to do that. That to me, as a long term shareholder, isn't consequential outside of the fact that when I open my portfolio, a five or ten percent drop doesn't look good on my portfolio. I would much rather it keep going up five or ten percent every day. The real action for that deposit, which is also tier one, which is a company that's also cashed up, which has uh, again, a chairman and, uh, and a CEO that has a history of monetizing these assets. Um, the midterm and the long term, I don't worry about. The short term, everything can get cheaper in the short term. And that's why timelines in this business are so important. And that's why, frankly, it's important to trim some profits when things are flying high and take care of the tax bills, take care of the tuitions, take care of some of the things that you know are going to be there no matter what happens to the stock market. So Anyway, that's my rant on tier one deposits and lithium and how things are shaping up as it relates to the lithium and critical metal sector in Canada. And 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 again, I, I, I look forward to results from CV9 from Patriot and Corvette and look forward to hearing how uh, the Albemarle relationship continues to develop. I want to talk more about my fake meat. <laughs> Let's talk about it. So I bought this fake meat. I was in the grocery store and I was going to make like a charcuterie board. Right. So I was looking for like some salami and, you know, I was just started grabbing. They're all like in the rolls, the, you know, tube of salami or whatever. So, you know, I get them and I get home and I, you know, get them out to start cutting up my meat and my cheese to make my little board. And I discover that one of them is plant-based. It is made out of fig and, um, for, for those of you not aware, Nick is of Italian descent. So when he is going to cut salami for a charcuterie board, oh, and he's also a hunter on a Sunday. <laughs> and he realizes he's fucking got fake meat. It was probably not the best time to be around Nick Hodge. But I digress. Continue, Nick. Well, you know, I take responsibility. It's my fault. I should have been a better consumer and looked more closely at the label. But I was in the meat section grabbing the meats, right? So um, anyway, they, they intentionally fooled me by placing the fig based meat next to the pork. But anyway, I'm not mad at them. This was the point of the story. I still served it. I had some uh, other meat on the board, obviously. And I just wanted to see what people thought of it because I didn't think it was great. So I put it out there and lo and behold, the guests called out the, the, the fake meat charcuterie, right? Like, what the fuck is this? Um, and I proceeded to tell them what happened, but it, it got me thinking about uh, almost uh, energy and, and, and lithium while you were talking about it. Not that I wanted to talk about my fake meat, but last week I was telling you about um, demand drivers in uranium. And I was saying that the France had applied to extend the life of the nuclear reactors in the UK. And I said that that was a, a uranium demand story, but that there was also a failed renewable story there that we could table. Well, Here's the failed renewable story through the lens of, of fake meat, right? Um, and, and you might know some of what I'm going to say because there's been a lot of solutions, right, for decarbonization and climate change over the past, whatever, 17 years since I've been watching the markets. Some are the real meat and some are the fake meat, right? 
Um, and there's been a lot of money spent on installing the fake meat and, and subsidizing the fake meat and, and trying to make the fake meat work. Um, but in some respects, it's been like putting, and this is good, I just thought of this, lipstick on a pig because... <laughs> I love this. You see all these stories come out now about, um, and I've always been pretty negative on clear solutions that weren't going to work like solar roads and the wave yeah, yeah, energy yeah. was never going to work because the shit rusts and the salt water and they still try to make that shit work but that stuff's not going to work right yeah yeah um but i was always into like efficiency and smart grid and nuclear because those are like real solutions and so now all of this is coming to bear right like the guests are figuring out that the fucking fig salami sucks like the UK, I saw a story on Bloomberg recently that was saying the 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 grid um, operators, the utilities that, that had um, wind assets were lying about how much wind they were producing to, to manipulate the rates, right? They were like um, overstating the amount of, of power that the, their wind assets were going to produce to um, manipulate the, the power weights in the real market. And then I saw another story about this solar installation, one of the biggest in the world that was supposed to last for like 25 years and it's being decommissioned after like 10 or 15 years. Like is not met, it's not efficient anymore, is, is not worth keeping up. So you're starting to see which of these assets uh, work and, and, and which don't. And so, you know, you'll see me out there talking about, you know, decarbonization and, and ways to, to invest in that and, you know, why clean energy stocks have been good. And that doesn't mean that all clean energy stocks are good, right? It doesn't right. mean that, you know, solar and wind and renewable stocks are good. In the same way um, that it doesn't mean that all, you know, gold stocks are good or that, you know, you can't buy a gold stock for the short term or the or the long term in, a, in different ways, right? So uh, back to Patriot and back to lithium, um, lithium it, in and in, in lithium batteries and electrification of transportation is one of the solutions that that works right once you get the grid in order and once you figure out the charging etc so um i've always sort of said with with patriot like i'm not worried about it in the long term like i bought some more at eight dollars or whatever it was yeah. and then it went to six like i'm not worried about <laughs> that because it's yeah. in the ira and it's away or whatever so um and then, so that's on the technology level, right? And then you look at the deposit level, and that's sort of what you were saying about tier one deposits and infrastructure, et cetera. Like some of these lithium deposits are the fake meat, right? And some of these deposits are the real meat. And I'm pretty pretty sure based on drill results and leadership, uh, et cetera, um, the, the caliber of companies that have invested in, in Patriot, that Patriot's got the meat. Patriot's got know. the meat. <laughs> Sometimes it's that simple, folks. So that's a that's that, that that's the that's my take on lithium and Patriot in general. And you know, a little sidebar there on Bravo tier one deposits. Look, Palladium's had its biggest crash since 2015. Doesn't help that that's a Palladium Palladium dominant project. You know, there's potentially game changing nickel discovery there, but also again, nickel's endured a slide as well. What the company does keep doing is adding value and 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 that's really how you get over this price dump hump right you've got to continue to add value they're cashed up they have plenty in the till they're on to potentially a new game changing discovery they're expanding the size of what's already a massive deposit likely by at least a factor of 2 to 2 and a half because both the trenching and the deeper drilling along the 8 kilometer corridor is proving to be not just consistent with historic grades but even better grades at depth, which you need to offset the fact that it's going to take a little bit more digging to get to the mineralization. But again, we're talking underneath the eight kilometers. So you're having to strip the top part to get to the bottom anyway. It's not like it's underground mining where you have to strip the whole entire top and that's all waste before you get to the goods. You're going to have to take the top off anyway. That's going to be profitable and economic. So eventually it, it, it'll get taken out at a significant premium. Um, privately, we've talked with management. We, we, we know what's acceptable. I can tell you what's acceptable is nowhere near today's levels. And so I, I rest easy in the long-term account, knowing that that will turn when it turns and when it does, it'll do so convincingly. You have to take the skin back off the suprasata too, so you can <laughs> cut into the real meat. 
You know what didn't have a real pork skin? The fake meat. Should have known. <laughs> I should have known. <laughs> oh, God. What else do we want to touch on? Um, we, we, we launched our new tech pub. Congrats to Mr. Curl. Congrats, Mr. Carl. Um, that's been fun to see. It's been well received. The feedback has been solid. Any thoughts on the pub and, and, and what comes next on that front, Nick? Um, the, the feedback has been good and it was well received. So, um, I was saying that was an offering that we hadn't provided and that that's a, a sector of the market that, that you and I don't really dabble in. Um, and so those guys are, are filling a hole or a, a void or a vacuum that we had here at Digest Publishing by providing that service to our readers. And, um, I guess as we suspected, some readers took us up on that, uh, immediately. It's been selling with really out any promotion. We've just been giving away the first yeah. free issue. Um, and people are reading that and then deciding to buy. So, um, if you want to do that, I think, as I said last week, go to dailyprofitcycle.com, um, scroll down until you find that, you know, recent article that is the first uh, free issue of digital dispatch and uh, give it a read. And, uh, if you like what you see there, then again, like I said last week, sign up. And if you don't, then don't, uh, but it, the timing is seemingly good. As I was saying earlier, the, you know, broad indices are back to all time highs. They're being driven by these tech stocks, um, and I keep seeing a, a lot of chatter still about semiconductors and AI and, and augmented reality and Apple Vision Pro, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Plus the um, the Bitcoin at 51 or 52 grand, which which you just mentioned. Yep. And so um, a lot to be excited about on, on the tech side of things and and deals, too. So, you know, I watch some things out of the corner of my eye. And I, for some reason, I was watching Vizio for a while since it IPO'd, I guess, because I was just interested in Vizio and. Like Walmart announced this week they were trying to buy Vizio for, um, I think it was like $2 billion. And then I learned that Walmart sells, I think, something like 30 or 40% of the TVs in the U.S. Maybe it's even more than that. And so, um, anyway, they're going to try to, Walmart yeah. is going to try to buy Roku, so they, or not Roku, excuse me, Vizio, so yep. they can install and have ads for Walmart and, and Walmart sold products, right, on the smart TVs and the apps that are on them, et cetera. Um, anyway, long-winded answer, but this was bad for Roku, right? Because Roku is also sold at Walmart, and I guess investors are thinking if Walmart is going to buy Vizio, then Walmart would probably push consumers towards Vizio products and not Roku products. And that's sort of the stuff that they're writing about and, and, and talking about and we'll be discussing in, in Digital Dispatch that I don't spend a lot of ink or keystrokes on. So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, by all means, check out Digital Dispatch. And if you want all of Mr. Curl and Mr. Carl's and Mr. Hodges and myself and uh, Ryan Stansel and a number of our talented people behind the scenes efforts, uh, straight to your inbox, go to dailyprofitcycle.com forward slash subscribe, click a button, it goes straight to your inbox. Again, if you want to read it, you can read it. If you don't, you just <laughs> get it out of there. It's pretty simple, folks. Um what else is uh, top of mind? I think uh, market-wise, we pretty much covered everything, unless you have anything else that you're dying to, to get off your chest. I do have one last comment, um, non-market related, that I want to make, which I thought was great. It brought a smile to my face, and I look forward to Monday nights a whole lot more than I used to now. Uh, but anything else market related or just life related that you want to get off your chest, Mr. Hodge? Cannabis stocks seem to be bullish. Um, I'll be writing more about it. We've just made just a little bit of money on cannabis stocks here in the past week or so. So something to watch out for, but uh, happy to talk about John Stewart because it was pretty good. Fantastic, right? Uh, it, it was exactly what I hoped it was. Uh, we all know John tends to lean left societally and politically. It was really refreshing to have a sharp, intelligent, articulate mind come on and dish it out equally and then equally do... I clearly don't do it at the scale that Mr. Uh, Stewart does, or and I clearly don't do it as eloquently. But you know, I have a knack for being able to piss off both my Republican and my Democrat friends with a lot of my opinions because I happen to not really like either party or most politicians for that matter. I am a firm believer that less government, not not zero government, folks. I'm not you know super out there, but less government, more efficient government is the way forward. And I don't see either of our major parties representing the populace's best interests, with the exception of the, you know, the rich, right? Which, you know, I guess we benefit from a little bit, Nick, and um, that doesn't make it right. So it was great to see John come out 
and give it to both sides. Um, I thought it was well done. I thought it was factual. I thought it really set the tone for the campaign cycle and election season that we find ourselves in. And I thought he ended it beautifully. He said it was so, it, it, it was so, it should have been the intro to the fourth turning, right? It was so fourth turning ish. Mm -hmm. At the end, he said, ultimately, in a democracy, it's up to the people, us being the people, to bring about the change. And I thought that was just the cherry on top, the mic drop, and a heck of a way to close out that first episode. Well, yeah, he was saying that, you know, what everyone, maybe not what everyone thinks, but certainly what I think, and it's that, and, it, you know, he says it more eloquently, right? So it gets the national conversation going. But basically, he was saying, I, I can't believe we're choosing between these two fucking old fogies. Again. You know, basically, as, as, as again, right? Yep. They set the record for the oldest people running the last time they read. So anyway, the, the takeaway for me was, I, I think sort of what you were alluding to, him saying at the end that, yeah, the election is important, but... Um, November 7th or whatever day it is, like, isn't the only day, like every day until then and every day after then matters as well. And then what you do on those days matters. So, and that's, you know, not exactly how I express it, but that's how I sort of think about my life. Like I manage myself and I manage my family and I manage my finances and I do what I can for, um, you know, our, my coworkers and our employees and my community where possible, but I don't spend every day thinking about, you know, if who's in office or who's running or whatever, because I've mostly checked out of that, uh, as you know, for the past decade or so. So um, anyway, that was funny. And also get out the vote, rock the vote, finger bang the vote. I think that was my favorite joke of the night. Great. That was great. That's all I got, everybody. This was the 257th episode of our weekly therapy session that we call Investing in Bizarro World. Regardless of who you would like to vote for, who you will want to vote for, or who you are going to vote for, between now and then, folks, and after, you can still be kind to each other. We can still agree to disagree civilly, and uh, you know we can still try to find a common ground to do common good on a lot of things, even if we just dis disagree on a lot of things as well. That's all I got. Mr. Hodge, send us off. That's it. Hope you have a good week. Um, keep your head on a swivel with these markets. Uh, volatility spiked and, and came back down. And um, there's just a lot going on out there, as, as we just discussed. So um, by all means, check out the, the free and paid research at Daily Profit Cycle. And uh, we'll see you back here next week. Hey there, you independent-minded investor. If you like this video, make sure to tell us so by clicking the like button below. Subscribe to our channel so you never miss another one and share it with everyone you know on social media. You can also click the link in the description below to check out more information-packed videos just like this one. Thanks for watching.